When I was a child, I had a real leaning towards writing. I was just really excited and thrilled about the written word because I was so excited that someone can have a thought in their mind, they can put it on paper. And when you read what's on this paper, that thought is transferred into your mind and you have an emotional reaction to it. And I think that is just like the coolest thing in the world. And after I started making quilts like Rotten Bones and Memorial Day, and people would stand in front of them and cry, or to hell with housework and this one, and people would stand in front of them and laugh. And I thought, my God, this is the equivalent of the written word. It sounds like you sometimes get inspiration from poetry. I do. My background is really literature. I've taught literature for years and years. And, and so I'm very interested in narrative. Actually, my, my current interest is just how you take what is an instant perspective. It's not in time. It has. It's, it's not a beginning and a middle and an end, and and find some way to form that into a narrative where where you've got a kind of linear, mm -hmm. so that the, the exhibit was a kind of narrative. And I've done, I did a couple of handmade books for the exhibit. Uh, what I wanted to be was a writer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I had just finished my one year of college studying English primarily, and uh, I was 26, and uh, uh, so I said, well, I could write that for you. Well, you'd have to know something about quilts. And I had heard a phrase that I loved uh, in uh, school, uh, which was the, all the available literature. I loved that. And I thought to myself, well, you know something about quilts? How about if I read all the available literature? How would that be? Which at the time, there was about eight or ten books. Mm -hmm. One night, Gwen came over to my apartment with a little crib quilt. It was a drunkard's path. And a big thimble that she had found someplace and said, if you're going to write persuasively about quilts, you need to know how to quilt. Hello and welcome to Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast. I'm your host, Yannickin Smucker. This episode features a panel discussion that was held live over Zoom on July 8, 2020, as part of a series of public virtual programming called Textile Talks. The Quilt Alliance joined fellow organizations, International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association for weekly programming beginning in April. You can watch the recorded presentations. There's a link to the whole series on our episode page at quiltalliance.org slash running stitch. And you'll want to keep that link handy to view the images uh, our panelists shared during the discussion, one of the limitations here of an audio podcast, and view the full presentation along with the complete Q&A if, if you like uh, the teaser here. Our panelists are all writers and quilt makers, and we asked them to discuss connections between these two creative pursuits. As an introduction, we have excerpts from previous interviews the Quilt Alliance has conducted with each of the panelists. First, we hear from journalist Meg Cox, who combines her professional life with her quilt making as a quilt journalist. Karen Musgrave interviewed Meg for QSOS in 2007. Uh, this quilt is my uh, homage to the Wall Street Journal, <laughs> where I worked for 17 years. And um, I um, call it black and white and red all over because the Wall Street Journal didn't have any color, uh, at least in years that I was there. And um, red is my favorite color. So this is a quilt that's uh, all black and white, except there's some little red triangles on the side and there's red thread. My book, uh, which we think is going to be called The Quilter's Catalog, will be published uh, early in 2007 by uh, Workman Publishing, and it will be a comprehensive resource guide for quilters, uh, including profiles of the top 20 quilt teachers and uh, enormous amounts of material about uh, fabric and uh, tools and technology and uh, the recent history, a lot about the quilt renaissance, and just a lot of tools for people, tools and tutorials and tips and uh, lots of teas, <laughs> all of that together, so it's everything. 
Next, we have Francis O'Rourke Dow, current president of the board of the Quill Alliance and novelist of books for both youth and adults. She's also the host of several Quilt podcasts, and we have links on our site to those. And here's an excerpt from Story B, the Quilt Alliance members web show from 2019. Uh, somebody who is a writer and a quilter, how, do you feel that it affects your quilting at all, being a writer and looking at the world as a story? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't know how much thought I've given to that. I think that you know, what, what I've thought about the m- most is how the creative process is the creative process is the creative process. You know, that it's, it's, it's that idea that gets you going and often things, what you end up is very different than what you thought you started with. But there is, you know, I, I mean, there are obvious parallels in terms of you are putting something together. And it's, you know, the, this book on writing that's coming out next summer is called How to Build a Story. It's constructed and a quilt is constructed. And you could draw all kinds of analogies between the, those processes. And, 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 you know, and I also think for me, and I, you know, I talk about mentioned earlier, and I actually talk a lot about this, about the importance of accepting failure as part of the creative process. And that is, you know, I I certainly have had many stories that just died on the table, and I've had quilts (laughs) that died on the table too. Um, So there's so much, but there is, and you know, there, there has to be energy and there has to be rhythm and there have to be patterns in both. So there really, there's a lot, a lot of crossover. Sean Kimber is a quilt maker who uses words directly on her quilts, and she's also a mathematician. We interviewed her for Story B in 2020. With your letters, is that uh, is it raw edged applique, or how do you do it? So it is a uh, improvisational technique uh, originated by Tanya Ricucci, mm-hmm. and um, she kind of gives recipes for how to make these letters so it's very intuitive um for me i just if i write a letter then i know how to build it Mm -hmm. and it becomes that way and everybody builds their own handwriting eventually after they do it and it's just all in the thicknesses that you use um some people make curves on the edges some people do sort of uh, triangular things to make the letters more similar to their writing. Mm -hmm. I like the squared off for some reason. I think it looks like a ransom note written by a really (laughs) crazy person. And somehow that just resonates with me. And finally, we have poet and quilt maker Gwen Westerman here reading from her poem, Song for the Mississippi River, at a 2018 gala for the Friends of the Mississippi River. De Wakpa Odoa, Song for the Mississippi River. Long before Louisiana woman and Mississippi man before old man river before wade in the water long before schoolcraft and ver itascaput before Father Hennepin and Saint Anthony before Mississippi, long before Hernando de Soto. With those introductions, let's pick up with the Textile Talks presentation with our panel discussion. Um, I'd like to first start off asking how um, one of the ways that quilts and writing are perhaps similar or perhaps different. How do the themes and ideas and inspiration for either of these forms um, manifest themselves in, in various ways? Is it a similar process or are they quite, quite different um, when you're writing compared to sewing? Well, you know, I talked about how, you know, from, I'm very notional. I like read something and suddenly I have to know all about it and uh, I go deep into rabbit holes. Um, and, and, and that, again, and a lot of my stories are written that way, are novels. That's where they start. You know, you often move away from that originating idea, um, and, and, but that's, it's, it's a real desire to explore. And I think a lot of my quilts are that way, too. One of the quilts that I showed in that last slide is called Sit-In. 
Um, and it was for, I saw the sketch by a, a, a marvelous artist named Beverly Buchanan. Um, and it's just a, a, a sketch of a chair, of a rustic chair. And I fell in love with the chair. And suddenly I was all about chairs and I was drawing chairs and, uh, and then making a, a template of, of, a, of a chair. And then, I, then and from there, it's like, all right, let's do a chair quilt. And, how, and you know, I imagine like Andy Warhol soup cans and then four big chairs. And I ended up just cutting out about 150 chairs out of colors and then playing her. And it just, you know, it just started because I saw a picture of a chair. And that's very much my process and everything, which means that uh, I do a lot of revising because I'm always going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole but yeah so it's very similar in that way but, yeah it sounds like it's yeah both ways it's like yeah diving in and and exploring the tangents okay. yeah good yeah meg oh well, i would say they're very different for me partly because the reason that i make them is uh, the audience is very different i make I write words mostly for my living and I write about things I care about, but um, I'm, it's what is that assignment require of me? And sometimes it's, you know, my own uh, idea, but with quilts, it's it, it coming from a much more personal place for me. I mean, I have taught uh, some beginner classes, but I'm not somebody who's making samples or who's making something that I'm going to exhibit in a show. So I think I'm coming from different places, but I think what is the same for me is that um, just my method is not to just start throwing either uh, the quilt together, the design of a quilt together, or an article. I'm a real planner. So, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I have to pull a lot of stuff together. I don't just know what, like, the lead of my story is going to be. So I'm pretty meticulous and methodical about gathering lots of information. And it's like it has to get to a boiling point before then, like, the initial image or the initial words become clear to me. And it's, it's, it, it works that, pretty much that way for quilts. So, um, Kind of following up on that, Meg, since you do write about quilts um, from a journalistic perspective, um, how does studying and writing and communicating about quilts in this way, how does it affect, does it affect the way you make quilts or your process or do you ever <laughs> learn about it, research something and write about it and then like oh I want to try this myself. I gotta do one of those yeah yes it does I, I, I was I really love this question because I never thought about that before and uh, one thing is um, when I was writing my book I was writing a 600 page resource guide for uh, uh, for quilters and there are 12 projects in there but the idea was that all the projects would be from famous quilters and not from me because I'm not a pattern maker but uh, but we really wanted beginner projects so I ended up having to create four projects so that was a way in which my writing you know, and so I, I did some of these, uh, I, I did, for example, a picture quilt that is my husband and I kissing on our wedding day, like a la Warhol, it's the same image four times and it's in the middle of a, of a quilt. And I ended up teaching that, teaching, you know, very simple quilts, but it, me teaching quilting was because I wrote about quilting. So that was, that was a weird one. So it has sometimes, or I have met somebody, I've interviewed somebody and I've thought, I, I really have to try that. So yeah, there is, there's a jump off there too. Sure. Well, when I started work on Friendship Album 1933, I love 1930s quilts anyways. And, and so that was a great excuse to try to make some of the quilts that my characters were making. It's, a, it's almost like set building. It was really fun to do a crown of thorns. And, and um, although, although I'll never machine a king size quilt, a, a machine quilt on my sewing machine, a king size quilt again. But, but it is fun. It's a way of immersing myself into character. And I also think when I'm making quilts, I sometimes have a heightened awareness, especially when I mess up, which I do on a fairly regular basis, like, oh, I can use this in a story. So it's kind of this meta observation. Um, and and then, no, then no mistake is wasted because I can write about it. So I really see, um, I, I once had, a, when I was doing my own research, I had a, um, one of the, the narrators I was interviewing told me that um, the, uh, the quilting stitch is almost like a signature and you can tell um, someone's quilting stitch, it's unique. I don't know if that's really true, but I do see some interesting similar similarities between um, 
the, the mark of words, um, text, even when it's written <laughs> in a word processor as we do today, and the stitch. Do you, any of you see some of those um, similarities or perhaps ways that those two things are different and similarly between language and pattern? Weigh in on that one. I think it's, it's a similar process in terms of creation for me because I'm taking small pieces and making a larger image, whether those are words or pieces of fabric. And um, I can definitely relate to Francis about falling into rabbit holes and coming out the other side with something totally different. Um, but a lot of times if something just doesn't quite work for me, I put it aside or I take it apart and uh, it becomes three different poems or it becomes uh, the landscape for the landscape background for a quilt. Um, and oftentimes I'm driven by word before image, like in Wachi Au, the song there. Um, and then sometimes the images come first. So it's, it's a similar creative process for me, taking those pieces and making something larger that tells a story. So I would say that um, I, I, I think we are a rabbit hole society here on the screen. Um, so, um, but for me, it's a chicken egg or cart horse uh, question of whether it's the words that come first or just an, a, an idea for a design and then I need the words that go with the design. But for the most part, I'm looking for the most uh, timeless statement that I can make uh, that encompasses the issues before us uh, that I want people to engage with. Um, so for instance, I will never make a Trump quilt, but I will make quilts about the human rights issues that we all face day to day, sometimes multiple times a day right now. And uh, because those are timeless, it's not just today that we discover there's racism, it's been a constant um, for centuries. Uh, so what is the broader statement that can be made that um, people years from now, not knowing what happened on July 8th, will be able to engage with and still get something from the expression? Thank you, Sean. In particular, when I see your quilts, I see the words are the pattern, and I really like um, the way um, it kind of blurs the line between its language and pattern all connected. Um, and they're really powerful that way. Anyone else wants to jump in on this question before we move on? Meg? Yeah, I, I am thinking now of, of playing more with the quilting in words. Uh, not not just a service design and um, this came to me partly you know speaking of how writing uh, the writing influences me um, the first issue of Quilt Folk I got to do I got to my first profile was Gwen Marston and so I was in her studio in uh, Beaver Island and somebody had written her a letter um, a quilted letter and she had it on her in, in a very special place by her sewing machine. And I, and, the, and I just kept thinking about that letter and what a beautiful, special way that was to write to somebody. Uh, and so for my sis sister's 65th birthday, that's what I gave her. And so it was, it was a, a quilted letter and it had you know, embellishments and her favorite colors and all that kind of stuff. But to have the words be, you know, really the point and again it is my writing it is that um she said that's your handwriting i mean i would know that from you know a mile away so um i think there's so many different ways that that can go together mm -hmm. sean mentioned uh when she was presenting her slides how um particularly the i can't breathe quilt was almost an act of meditation um, and I, many quilt makers in, in the QSOS um, oral history project talk about quilting as a meditative act. And I certainly see that and or feel that in my own um, quilt making as well. In what ways um, are either or both writing and sewing meditative for any of you? I have never had a meditative moment writing in my life. So I'm really curious to hear if anyone's going to say yes. And even with, and I have to say with sewing, chain piecing is probably the most meditative 
But otherwise, there's so much movement in quilting, which is one of the things that I like about it. I mean, you're moving from station to station. That's my, I always say knitting is sitting and quilting is moving. And so I find knitting very meditative, but, but quilting, and that, again, I like that, um, that jumping around a little bit. Um, so no, <laughs> but, no but what writing never, writing is no. <laughs> Well, I, I second that. My writing is never meditative for me. It is hard. It's just hard. I, I love it, and I love parts of it, and I love having done it. But it's, it, I just, I just don't think it ever is. Uh, for quilting, it's, some things are, most things are not. I think putting on a binding is. Some people don't like that. I, for me, that I like that. I'll do, I'll do some for you, John. I like that. And I, and, I, and I think one of the rare times that I had a real meditative experience with quilting was a, a memorial quilt I made of my husband's shirts. Mm -hmm. And I had already made one quilt from his shirts for, for uh, his granddaughter. So I had gotten over like the terror of just, you know, cutting through it. And once I had, and I was working on one for me and mine was much smaller pieces. Um, that became meditative Take, even taking the shirts apart became meditative and you know uh, it was a lot of it was improv and some of that was meditative in a way that quilting usually is not for me at all because it's usually more of a pattern and that was very improv so I so I think sometimes for quilting never for writing that's my answer <laughs> So writing, yeah, go ahead, Sean, jump in. Yeah. I just want to leap in and say that there are forms of journaling that are deeply, deeply meditative. And so, especially when I'm trying to find the right way to say the thing that I want to say, I will write uh, for set periods of time for days and then come back and read and the, the nugget's going to be in there somewhere. And sometimes just putting something down on paper is a release. And so I think the problem is you guys are doing it for your living and perhaps that intentionality that others are going to see this and you're like, oh my God, it has to be perfect. That, that can impede that. And so just understanding that some of us don't want the public to see what we write. And so I have the same problem with quilting now, by the way, is I'm terrified to sit down and start making a quilt sometimes. And so it's an well, interesting thing. Yeah, Sean raises an important part point it's about the kind of writing, which I, like Meg as a journalist, is her writing is quite different than Gwen as a poet. Um, is writing poetry meditative? It can be, uh, but it's it's a similar process for me. And whether it's it's um, poetry or or fiction or a short essay, um, I do a lot of journaling and and try to write every day, even if all I'm doing is making, you know, loops on the page because there's nothing in my head to come out. Uh, but I write with a pencil and I write on paper because there's a texture and a feel to that that is very calming to me. Um, but I love editing. I'm a technical writer by profession. So um, reading, reading what I've written out loud and listening for Pickups um, is is also a process that I enjoy. I shouldn't have said that out loud, but I enjoy. It. <laughs> but but the, you know, same thing for me: chain piecing, uh, strip cutting, um, By, a binding. I hadn't thought about that, and also some of the hand quilting that I have done mm -hmm. been meditative. Now that I don't know, yeah. So that's kind of the yes, that is meditative for me. Well, I want to segue here. Um, uh, Sean, in particular, um, sort of started talking about, um, well, I think maybe a couple of you about as you start a project. Um, I was thinking about the comparison uh, between a blank page and the, <laughs> the uncut cloth or the blank design wall, however it is that you work. Um, what is it like to, to start a, a project in either of these forms? Are there um, things that are similar about that process, challenging or, or less so? I, first of all, I think the creative process is the creative process. So you tend to start with a big head of steam. Like, this is amazing. My idea is amazing. I am a genius. And that you, you go through that burst of energy, which is fabulous. And then all of a sudden you realize, this isn't amazing. I'm not a genius. I don't think I can do this. But I, the, the good thing about having done both, I mean, I've written all my life, but I've made quilts long enough now. 
No, there's like, if you go in knowing, you're going to have to revise. I, to me, that's the greatest liberty. Um, and I, I am a, uh, it's much cheaper as a writer to revise and as a quilter to, revi to revise, but I do both. And so I go in knowing that probably the big idea that propelled me and motivate, motivate me is, motivated me is going to go by the wayside, but also that there's this process of discovery um, that's amazing and that, which is my favorite part of the creative process. So after, once you start failing is when you get into the really interesting places, but I always know there's going to be a lot of revising going on and, and that's good because it makes it less scary to put something on the design wall or to put something down on paper because you know it doesn't have to be perfect or even good. You just have to begin. Yeah, I'd say there's something to be said for swatching. So knitters, um, well, I'm a knitter too. And yeah, I find swatches to be annoying, but there is something great about testing something out in a very small way. And there you can undo it and still reuse the yarn, which you can't always do with the fabrics that you're using. Um, but there are some projects where it takes me months working through different ideas to come up with what will be the, the one that we launch off into, um, especially when I'm working with fabrics that I can't replenish, right? Um, so I work with some things that are finite, um, uh, sort of honorary memorial quilts where you're using the clothing <laughs> of your loved one. Uh, it can be more daunting to chop into those fabrics uh, because a mis any mistake feels a little bit more painful. Um, I, I so in my day job, I write a lot. <laughs> and so I, I have a similar blank whenever I sit down to that blank screen. It's just sort of like, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get through this project? And so you have to kind of turn off all the judgment that's in your head um, in both writing and quilting in order to get to get anywhere, I think. Yeah, I'm familiar with, with all that judgment in your head <laughs> as you get, get started. Um, yeah, I'm in the midst of a major writing project now, so I'm, I'm feeling it. Um, Sean, I wanted- Thank you, it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sean, I particularly wanted to, to check in with you. I, I know you're an academic mathematician, um, and I wondered if that also relates to these, and, and of course you, you write, you write about math, and you're a quilt maker, an artist. Like, how do these three things uh, intersect in your world? Um, for a long time, they didn't um, by design. So I'm, I work in a male-dominated profession. So any sense that anyone would know that I was a quilter was something I didn't want out there uh, until I was fully promoted to full professor. Um, and just a few weeks ago, I was given an endowed chair. So now I can be freely out and no one can do Rats. anything. Right? <laughs> um, but I, so in fact, the quilting was what I did to escape from that world. And so I desperately tried not to pursue any sort of mathematical themes in my quilts. Um, were I to be forced to make a quilt today uh, that had any sort of mathematical relation, it would be a whole bunch of puns that very few people would understand, right? So um, I'm not sure I will ever embark on that quilt. Yeah, I was wondering if it was sort of like a, I mean, to be simplistic, a right brain, left brain, kind of keep these um, things separate or, yeah. No, you know, the level of create, so higher level of math is more like philosophy. Okay. So again, connecting in back into that writing. So when you read my journal articles, the only numbers are the page numbers. So it is a very linguistic uh, science. Um, it, we call ourselves the humanists of the science. Uh, and, um, and so, yeah, no, the, the, love, the creativity is very different. And I've actually been on panels about sort of what, it, what is the difference in the creative process um, between science and art. And it's fascinating. There's neuroscience research related to it and everything, which I learned on the panel. It was awesome. Fantastic. Um, does anyone want to jump in with any final comments before we turn to our, um, we've got a lot of, of stuff going on in the Q&A. We want to make sure we have a chance for our audience to ask some questions as well. 
Meg? Well, I guess what I wanted to say is that uh, just f for all the quilters out there, I think that in, the, in very, very many ways, quilts speak for themselves. But I just want to put in a plug for letting your quilt speak even louder by putting a label on it. That's an important place for words and quilts to come together. <laughs> Amen. And, and that, of course, is one of the um, key goals of the Quilt Alliance, the national nonprofit participating and um, host, hosting this um, today's session of the Textile Talks. And along with always labeling your quilts, we, we do want to expand our oral history project even more. We're at a really great transitional state uh, with the QSOS um, oral history project. We have a new archival partnership with the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky, where we've been able to get all of the audio digitized, and which is why we're able to, to launch this podcast, Running Stitch. And we are really excited about continuing to build on, on the current momentum and really advance this project into the, into the 21st century and uh, um, share it with more and more people. Um, so Hopefully we can interview each, each of you quilt makers as well for the QSOS project. To conclude our discussion, the panelists took questions submitted by audience members participating over Zoom. You'll hear Quilt Alliance Executive Director Amy Milne asking these questions. So the first one is uh, for everyone. Do you find that people uh, learn from your quilts? Sometimes the visual tells a stronger story than the written word. As writers, which do you feel is stronger to you, the quilting, the writing, or the quilting? I would say a lot of people learn from uh, the work that I do, especially when it focuses on culture and history and language uh, for Dakota people. And um, that seems to be a less intimidating uh, format for uh, people to come to this history. And um, I, I really appreciate the comments that I get when people see my work or, and the questions that they have or the realization that there's more to learn and they want, want to learn more. So that I think is what I, what I really value about that interaction with people. Quilts um, are less intimidating sometimes than history books or math books. <laughs> math books are awesome. But um, I do want to say that uh, despite us having used the medium of the quilt for a long, long time, it still has the element of surprise when you uh, use them to express things that they're not expecting to be confronted with in that venue. And I think that we can all start making those quilts and it'll still hold that power. Anybody else? Well, I would just say that um, the uh, Quilt Folk magazine is doing something it's never done before, which is uh, we're, we're taking in reader submissions and we're going through 250 reader submissions. But having the experience of going through uh, the stories and the pictures, it's it's amazing how they complement each other. And there are some quilts that you would look at and say, yeah. Nice quilt. But if you knew the story behind it, if you knew how this person helped her mother with dementia make that quilt, it would it would look completely different to you. So it's uh, I am having a whole lesson uh, mm. <laughs> about how 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 the two uh, work together and magnify each other. And quilts are very very powerful. And I and I love what Sean just said about how uh, carrying different kinds of messages in them. It's it's. It's, and it's a whole new power. Um, it's the old and the new and the, all of that happening at, at once, I think is a very powerful thing right now. And it's one of the reasons why quilts are still a powerful medium. This question is a good segue to that. Um, for anyone on the panel, do you consider yourself a risk taker? If yes, in what ways? I guess that could be writing or quilting or both. Hmm. Sean looked like you were going to say something. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
So back in the day, I used to call myself a stunt crafter. Um, and I keep asking myself the question, how much smaller can I make this log cabin, right? Um, and that the same thing comes in how, how can I test the boundaries of propriety in the text that I choose to put on a quilt or whatever expression I'm trying to make. And um, sometimes I go way over the line on purpose. And um, other times it really is just trying to hug the line and keep people in the boat so that we can continue having a conversation. So yes, I take risks, too many sometimes. <laughs> I feel like I take risks um, in, in perhaps a different way, although my guess is there's some overlapping and that I always wanna make quilts that I can't make. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and a lot, of, and, and you know, I was thinking, my, I don't know that my quilts would teach anyone anything other than imperfectionism is okay, and you can still make a decent quilt that's not perfect, but I do. I love trying, I love messing around, and I do, and I, I feel like in creative work in general, whether you're writing or quilting or whatever it is that you love to do, it's like you should always be trying to do something you can't and always trying, you know, that that's where the, I think that's where the joy and the excitement is. I mean, and it's where the failure is as well, but I'm also a big believer in, in failing, <laughs> but so anyway, so yeah, so it's so, I, but I do, I like trying things that I can't actually do. I think that's great. And I, I have found that to be true that I try and say yes to things that sometimes are scary to me. And I was asked to go on the quilt show, uh, TV show with the, uh, Ricky Timms and Alex Anderson. And then, then they told me after I said yes, that I would have to be uh, in a challenge. I would have to make a quilt about Broadway. They were each making a Broadway quilt. And, and I'm like, ah, <laughs> and then I would have to demo it on camera. So that was, I didn't, no, I was in for that bigger risk, but I ended up doing a word quilt. I had, my my uh, composer was Stephen Sondheim, and I did a quilt about Into the Woods, and I covered the trees with words, and all the leaves had uh, Cinderella's first and last words are "I wish," and so mm -hmm. it's a, it's a quilt about Broadway covered with words, <laughs> but it felt very scary. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I um, Gwen, did you want to answer that one too? Do you want to say anything else? Oh, you're looking Are at you a risk taker who used to jump off of the roof of the house with an umbrella trying to be Mary Poppins. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can be a risk taker. Um, and sometimes it's, it, it's, it's so spontaneous that it doesn't seem like a risk. Um, but um, I hand dye a lot of fabric and um, it's it's one of those situations where you never know what you're going to get and that's that's a, a more mundane example of the risk <laughs> that i take <laughs> but but a risk none, nonetheless um i hate to cut off the questions because there are so many thank you all thank you panelists and yannick and you all were wonderful thanks amy oh we appreciate it Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. This was very fun. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. You can watch the full presentation with images of some of the amazing quilts each of these artists has created on our episode page. If you enjoyed the podcast, you'll enjoy Quilters Take a Moment, a virtual event coming in September, rebranded this year since we weren't able to gather in person for Quilters Take Manhattan. I'll be hosting a panel discussion called The Quilt Keepers with five panelists, Emily Bodie, Dr. Carolyn Maslumi, Julie Silber, Mary Kay Waldvogel, and John M. Walsh III, focused on collecting, documenting, preserving, and protecting quilts and their stories. Tickets are available at quiltalliance.org, and with these tickets, you'll be able to participate live on September 25 and 26 and access the full recordings anytime thereafter. We've come to a complete run of our first season of Running Stitch, and we'd love to know what you think and hear who you'd like our guests to be in season two. Email us at qsos at quiltalliance.org or hit us up on any social media platform. We look forward to sharing more QSOS interviews with you. As always, thanks for supporting our initiatives to record and share the stories of quilts and quilt makers.
Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast, is a project of the Quilt Alliance, a member-supported national nonprofit dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing the stories of quilts and quilt makers. Running Stitch is hosted and written by me, Yannick and Smucker, and I serve as co-producer with QSOS project manager, Emma Parker, with support from Quilt Alliance executive director, Amy Milne. This podcast is generously funded by the Robert and Artist James Foundation. QSOS Oral History interviews are archived with our partners, the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky Libraries and at the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. You can listen to full interviews and see photos of quilts at our website, qsos.quiltalliance.org. Running Stitch features music by Chris Ezelgroth, accompanied by a Singer Featherweight, and Amy's Best Sewing Shears. (laughs) 